diseases. Uh, uh, first, I, first of all, I, I want to introduce uh, the first speaker. Uh, he is one of the most eminent uh, professors in the field of thoracoscopy in the world. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Philippe Astoul, uh, Professor of Medicine, Head of the Division of Thoracic Oncology, Plural Diseases and Interventional Pulmonology, Marsilia, France. Uh, his uh, talk will be under the title of Medical Thoracoscopy after 100 years. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and my honor to be today. It's always a pleasure to be in Egypt and to share ID concerning thoracoscopy with people from other countries. And uh, it's difficult for sure for me to summarize uh, 100 years of thoracoscopy within 30 minutes, but I try my best to show you what's happened from the first uh, Bosini light conductor till the first thoracoscopy by Jacobeus in 1910. What's happened? and what is thoracoscopy today, and maybe what is the next step for the future of thoracoscopy. Just to remind you that uh, thoracoscopy, it's a very simple procedure. You can perform it under local anesthesia or general anesthesia. I think that the main point is to keep the patient in spontaneous breathing, and then it makes the procedure very easy. As you can see here, the patient is lying on the healthy side, it's wrapped. Usually we use uh, a lower point of entry for the diagnosis of pleural effusion and a higher point of entry for the management of pneumothorax. I'll be back a bit later on that. The first step of the procedure is to induce an artificial pneumothorax using a needle or you can dissect directly uh, the chest wall and after create, as you can see on this uh, short video, the pneumothorax is active pneumothorax because the patient is breathing spontaneously, spontaneously and then you can uh, make the lung collapse, etc. after you dissect the uh, chest wall. Uh, the next step will be to place a trocar in proper position. As you can see, it's, it's a 7 mm trocar. Uh, you have 7 mm trocar here and the 5 mm uh, insulated trocar to use the coagulative forceps just in case you need, or depending on the procedure you have to perform. The telescope are a seven millimeter telescope, a zero degree angle, or oblique one, but I think the most important tool is this optical biopsy forceps, and 95% uh, uh, of your procedure are done with a single point of entry using this device, and we perform a second point of entry just in case of biopsy of vascularized area or parietal pleura, the bleeding, thoracoscopy debridement, coagulation of or airlic, adesiolysis or pulmonary biopsy, as you can see here. It's a very simple to make a first point of entry and the second one under vision control. You can stop the, the sound, please, of the, if it's possible. Then, as you can see here, after inducing the artificial pneumothorax, so you can have a good view on the pleural cavity. For instance, in this asbestos exposed patient, you can see pleural plaques, typical pleural plaques here. But uh, which is very interesting is that uh, uh, between these benign pleural plaques, we have the lung here, the parietal pleura, you see there is non-specific lymphangitis. And it was a mesothelioma at a very early stage disease. This woman uh, with a breast cancer are a metastatic perifusion, as you can see here. There is a huge involvement of the precardiac fat. The lung is free of disease, but conversely, you have uh, nodules on the parietal pleura, in particular on the diaphragm, as you can see here. And for sure, it's impossible to reach the nodules using percutaneous pleural biopsy. Same for this patient with uh, a sarcoma, as you can see, with huge nodules on the diaphragm, and you can easily understand that with blind pleural biopsy, it's impossible to get 
uh, the diagnosis. Uh, the techniques for pleural biopsy is that we call uh, a peeling biopsy, I mean using optical biopsy forceps. You can easily uh, grasp, uh, palpate the pleura, grasp the pleura, and, and you can get a very deep biopsy. You see on this side, you, you see the rib, which means that it's very deep biopsy. You see the rib in this place, as you can see here. And usually we, we take more than 20 specimens of this side, and uh, this makes our pathologists very happy, very busy, but happy, and makes the procedure very relevant for the diagnostic route. The second uh, indication, main indication, is the management of spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, of course, it's easy to insert a thoracoscope during a, a spontaneous pneumothorax. As you can see here, you see the apex of the left lung with the subclavian artery here. There is a blebs here. In this view, you can see below the difference. It is that uh, there is vascularization on the surface of the blebs. There is no vascularization on the blebs, and you can make whatever you want at this level to cut the blebs, to cut the bull. Even there is no study showing that it's useful to resect abnormality on the surface of the lion for the management of pneumothorax. After the end of the procedure, you have to re-expand the lung. As you can see, you put a chest tube and you expand the lung as in this patient, for instance, uh, after tal poudrage uh, with uh, malignant nodules, as you can see here and during uh, uh, the procedure you can see what's happened inside. Uh, however, for diagnostic thoracoscopy, usually we remove the chest tube on the table. It's easy to do as you do in the world, in patients with the pleural drainage, as you can see here. And for diagnostic procedure, you can manage thoracoscopy procedure in the hospitalization. It's our uh, procedure, our policy, in Marseille in particular, and you can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, ask the patient to, to, uh, to leave the hospital the same day or the day after the procedure. It means a short-term hospitalization. Uh, diagnostic um, thoracoscopy is also a therapeutic procedure, in particular for the poudrage, as you can see here, in case of recurrent malignant pleural effusion, for instance, for outside, we use a double balloon and suffleter. For pneumothorax, we use one gram of talc, of calibrated, dedicated talc. And for uh, recurrence of malignant pearl effusion, usually we use uh, four gram of talc. As you can see here, it's easy to apply under visual control, and you carefully spread the talc on the pearl cali. The most advanced procedure uh, using medical thoracoscopy is a pulmonary biopsy. It's not, so, uh, it's not so difficult to do, as you can see here. Uh, the aim is to get a scar uh, with no air leak, with not bleeding, as you can see here. Uh, the techniques is to grasp with coagulating force. Uh, it means second point to grasp the lung and to remove the lung. Usually it's very useful for superficial part of the lung, but uh, uh, I have to say that if you need, for, for instance, a strong suspicion of vascularitis or something like that, you have to, to go to the uh, wedge resection. But in this case, it could be very useful for uh, uh, malignant situation, for infection situation, or of course for the management of a visceral pleural anormality. The last indication, in my opinion, is the management of MPM, which is always a problem, is our practice. Just uh, I remind you that uh, uh, in case of uh, pleural effusion in, uh, and MPM, uh, you can get this kind of pleural feature of uh, with this or a true MPM or a fistula. And it's possible uh, using thoracoscope to debriding the pleural cavity. For instance, this patient has, um, uh, has uh, an MPM and you can see there us uh, all this non-vascularized adhesion, and as you can see here, at the beginning you have the parietal pleura and the biopsy shown that it was uh, pleural tuberculosis. Same for this patient, with second point of entry, you can see there all this adhesion, uh, which uh, not are vascularized, and at the end of the procedure, you have the good examination of the posterior parietal pleura, and we found for this patient a pleural adenocarcinoma. And then it's a very interesting procedure in this case too. 
Then what is the future for thoracoscopy? I have to say that um, um, thoracoscopy is a window to the pro space for research mainly. I think we have to develop the research in this field which is very important and I would like to show you a few, uh, few examples concerning, concerning this, uh, this field of research and the use of thoracoscopy uh, for research. Uh, maybe the first point is to analyze the so-called inconclusive thoracoscopy. As you can see on this slide, this is a very nice paper, a nice study carried out by Jules Janssen from the Netherlands, uh, analyze uh, 200 inconclusive, I mean around 30% of inconclusive thoracoscopy, and he uh, found false negative in only 31 cases at the beginning was 700 exudate. It's interesting to, f to analyze what's happened for these 31 malignants. These first negative were malignant, but as you can see here, mesothelioma was the main false negative result. And I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the next speaker we, uh, is going to talk about mesothelioma, but it, it's really a problem. And I think thoracoscopy is very, fus very useful for that because you have to, to take a multiple number of samples in the pleural cavity. But as I told with Julie Jansen, the author of this paper, I'm not sure that it was a false negative because sometimes we have at the very early stage disease hyperplasia, dysplasia of the parietal pleura, and maybe it's not worth a false negative. But sometimes inconclusive thoracoscopy usually are difficult thoracoscopy. I mean procedure hamper by adhesion and when you have fibrinol layer on the pleura. It's a reason why we develop the biopsy, the biopsy. I mean you have at the first step to take the fibrous part of the parietal pro and after biopsy on the same site again in order to get uh, a under underlying disease and pleural disease. The other point is to analyze which kind of results we have from the uh, thora medical thoracoscopy in particular for mesothelium. This study we did in, in Marseille with our colleague from Italy show that we miss biphasic uh, mesothelioma uh, um, 12, uh, 12 uh, mesothelioma we found after the initial histo histological diagnosis um, under, underwent, uh, done by thoracoscopy was reviewed after extrapural pulmonectomy and we find that 12 epithelial tabwares were true biphasic type and conversely. Maybe, uh, but I have to say that this result had the same that our colleague uh, thoracic surgeon and uh, uh, thoracic uh, surgical thoracoscopy uh, doesn't make be better than uh, medical thoracoscopy in mesothelioma as previously described. For instance, you see this patient with its asbestos exposure with typical pleural plaques. Uh, diagnostic procedures show uh, pleural plaques and uh, non-specific pachypleuritis on the parietal pleura. It was also an early stage disease of mesothelioma. Uh, sometimes uh, when we perform thoracoscopy, we uh, find the so-called black spots. These black spots are uh, anthracotic deposits on the parietal pleura, as you can see here, here, here. And we know for the study we did with my mentor, Professor Boutin, that uh, these black spots are, uh, are in the special uh, location on the parietal pleura, uh, near the so-called vanc stoma. I remind you that the vanc stoma connecting the pleural cavity with submesothelial lymphatic vessel. And we know that uh, on the parietal pleura around this vanc stoma, there are very important cells as uh, macrophages and lymphocytes. And we know also that when we sample this special area, we can find oncogenic asbestos fiber. And the, uh, one of the important message is that in asbestos exposed patients, when there is non-specific aspect of the parietal pleura, we have to sample, we have to sample these so-called black spots. The other point is to make relevant our therapeutic procedure, in particular the poudrage. I think now in 2010, there is no question concerning the safety of talc. 
This study published in Lancet three years ago, it was a multi-center prospective trial with, uh, with a lot of, uh, as you can see here, a lot of uh, team, uh, European team and one team from South Africa, involving uh, 558 patients. Uh, undergoing uh, talc poudrage with dedicated talc in case of malignant, recurrent malignant prolipation show, show no RDS, zero on 558 uh, patients, as you can see here. And then it's clear that talc, dedicated, calibrated talc is safe now. The other point is to study what's happened after tap prudage in terms of inflammation of the parietal pleura. As you can see, this study carried by, by my friend, uh, Marios Frudarakis from Greece, shows that uh, there is an increase in fever, sure, but also in C-reactive protein after prudage, as well as uh, the increase in weight by count concerning, in particular, the neutrophile. Uh, another study carried out by uh, Paco Rodriguez Panadero from Sevilla, Spain, shows that uh, the, uh, the increase of neutrophil in the parietal pleura uh, after poudrage is a proof of the success of the talc progress and conversely, when you have a decrease in dedimer in the, to the pleural cavity, there is a, a failure of talc poudrage. And uh, what is important, because I am pulmonologist, but I am oncologist too, and as maybe you, know, you don't know, but in Marseille, uh, pulmonologists uh, uh, do uh, thoracoscopy, but also chemotherapy in uh, cancer patient. But uh, which is fascinating for the future, it's uh, to screen tumor marker. Uh, I mean to screen the original tumor, but also the metastasis. And we have a lot of study in, uh, ongoing study in Marseille, trying to differentiate in terms of tumor marker, the original tumor, I mean in particular lung tumor or breast cancer, and also the tumor marker in the pleural cavity, as shown by this paper by Loden Kemper concerning the estrogen and progesterone status, of primary, primary tumor and metastasis, pro metastasis, showing that there is, a, there is no correlation between uh, original tumor and metastasis, which can modify the therapeutic strategy in the field of uh, oncology, which is important. We do not know so far, because it's too early to say, that if it uh, modifies the, the patient's survival, but as oncologists, and it's, in, it's true also for bronchoscopy. In the future, I'm sure we are going to have to sample the primary tumor, the recurrent disease, but also all the metastasis because sometimes the immunohistochemical markers are very different and it can make the therapeutic strategy different too. The future of thoracoscopy is to improve the technique I mean, for instance, to use as uh, ambulatory procedure, and this study we recently published uh, on, redo on redo medical thoracoscopy shown that it's feasible to perform a second thoracoscopy, uh, for instance, to check uh, the efficacy of uh, previous uh, therapy, but uh, also uh, to, uh, to check uh, if uh, something new happened in the pleural cavity, of course, when there is no same phases. And as you can see here, it was feasible, but it's also feasible in short-term hospitalization because in Marseille, as I previously said, we usually remove the chest tube on the table and you see that the median duration of uh, uh, our uh, hospitalization lens is one day in 224 last patient. And it's very cost effective, effective procedure. And for administration to have this kind of argument, it's very important, of course, the cost effectiveness of a procedure. Uh, improvement of thoracoscopy is also to uh, use uh, uh, new uh, devices as, for instance, mini thoracoscope, the so-called mini thoracoscopy, as you can see here. It's a regular one, it's a mini thoracoscope, it's a three to four millimeter 
diameter, as you can see, the view are not so bad. It's the same patient with a standard thoracoscopy, I mean using 7 mm thoracoscope, and mini thoracoscopy using 3 mm or 4 mm one. Um, the uh, biopsy are feasible. The problem for this uh, procedure is that uh, you are going to get small biopsies, which is a problem in particular in the area with high prevalence of mesothelioma. And the instruments are very fragile, and uh, you are going to uh, have difficulty uh, to, bio to sample heart pleura. And for sure, before going to this mini thoracoscopy, you absolutely have to get an experience in standard thoracoscopy, just, just in case you need a conversion, uh, as in this study carried by our colleagues from Brescia, Italy. New device is also maybe flex rigid thoracoscope. I know very well this instrument, even I use only rigid one, because we, we designed 15 years ago with the Professor Boutin the first prototype, which was very bad, but the new one is very good. But the problem, my opinion, is that it's not a problem, flex rigid or rigid one. I think uh, this maybe can spread the thoracoscopy procedure because uh, I'm sure for pulmonologists there is a kind of psychological barrier using rigid instrument and maybe pulmonologists doing bronchoscopy uh, feel more comfortable to use flexible instrument. I think it is a reason. It's very nice instrument. It's possible to make a very careful analysis, this, uh, this picture. Uh, was given by my, my friends, uh, Japanese friend Atsuko Ishida from uh, Kawasaki in, um, in Japan. As you can see here, the view is not so bad and you can make biopsy. But again, as you can see here for this patient with lung cancer, uh, invading the parietal pleura in particular, it's possible to get a nice biopsy sample. Same in case of tuberculosis, pleurisy, as you can see in this case. or uh, the problem is, of course, it's easy procedure. It's like to put a chest tube into, plur into in the pleural cavity. It's similar technique and designed to flexible bronchoscope. But the problem is that you get smaller biopsy samples. It's very time consuming, particularly under local anesthesia. And also, you have only one port of entry, and the biopsy samples are very, very teeny which can be a problem. The next future of thoracoscopy will be for sure uh, some uh, new device as uh, narrowband imaging, for instance. I remind you that it's a new optical image with enhancement uh, used for highlighting blood vessels on mucosal surface and uh, mucosal pattern. By changing the spectral feature of light used for endoscopy observation, we published this paper very recently in respiration. It's uh, um, narrowband imaging and as you can see here you can see with one band the surface vessel very clearly and we also band the more deeper vessel uh, for the future maybe it will be uh, very interesting in particular for the early stage plural disease of cancer for instance you can see this patient with a white light and with NBA you can see the vessel on the surface in this case, it's so-called cerebriform pattern after NBA. I think it should be very interesting for the food, but uh, we have to improve this, uh, these techniques. The last purpose is, uh, as for bronchoscopy, the fluorescence techniques. Uh, I do want, uh, uh, the aim is to improve the diagnostic accuracy of tumor in the delineating the tumor margin to precise staging of intratoraxin abnormalities for the management of pneumothorax also. I don't want to talk about uh, thoracic fluorescence diagnostic combined with PDD because it's very, for us, very heavy and not very comfortable to use. But maybe the autofluorescent VCO thoracoscope, the so-called DEF uh, techniques, uh, should be interesting. As you can see here, in patients with parietal inflammation, you can, uh, with um, uh, autofluorescent, you can see this, uh, this lesion here. Same for this patient, and you see here the non-specific inflammation aspect highlighted by the procedure. Same for this mesothelioma, for instance. Of, of course, there are also two negative uh, on the diaphragm in particular for this patient. 
false positive, sometimes in case of inflammatory tissue, this technique also has to be improved for sure. The last point is the fluorescein enhanced autofluorescent thoracoscopy, as shown by my friends Mark Nopen from uh, Brussels, Belgium. Um, the, I think the, uh, the main point is the management of uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. For instance, you see these two pictures from patient with pneumothorax with a single bleps for this patient with huge bulla. Of course, a surgical management of this patient will be to reject these bleps and also to cut, to cut this bulla. The problem is with white light that you cannot see this very special porosity of the pleura, which is the genesis of the pneumothorax in this case, and cutting the bulla here, you left in place the pathological part of the lung. And it is questionable again in the management of pneumothorax, we do not know so far if we have to resect such bulla. For sure, for this patient, for instance, this bulla, plenty of air, is not the original way for pneumothorax. Conversely, this pleura porosity, we know, we know by microscope, electronic microscope uh, analysis of this, that there is a dehiscence between two cells and the genesis of pneumothorax is this area. And then autofluorescence in this case can uh, enhance this special area and maybe rule out the need for resection of abnormality on the, on the bullet. My last slide, which is a newer fluorescence technique, the next future will be the near infrared thoracoscopy of tumoral proteasis activity for improved detection of peripheral lung cancer, but also the virally detective fluorescent imaging, etc., etc. And just, I would like to say my, my mentor, as you can see here, of course, there is a Jacobeus because it's a centenary of Jacobeus this year. You see here my mentor, Professor Christian Boutin, Robert London Kemper from Germany, Gianfranco Tassi, Brescia, Mark Noben, Paco Panadero, Casalini, etc., etc. And my last slide is to remind you the next and the first European Congress for Broncology and Interventional Pneumology, which will be held in Marseille in March. You are very welcome in Marseille, the chairman and my young colleagues and my main collaborator, Hervé Duto, and it will be our pleasure to welcome you in Marseille in March 2011. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for uh, Professor Philip for his uh, elegant presentation about medical uh, thoracoscopy. And now we may uh, invite the second speaker, uh, Professor Semra, Associate Professor of Pulmonology is me of Turkey to speak about pleurotheses in mesothelium. Chairman, dear colleagues, merhaba and selam to all of you. I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, but merhaba and selam are the same in Turkish. <laughs> it does not proceed. I pushed it. As you all know, malignant mesothelioma is a uniformly fatal malignancy. It originates from pleura, peritoneum, pericardium, and tunica vaginalis. The exact prevalence is unknown, but it is less than 1% of all malignancies. Incidence is increasing. Expected peak will be in the next 10, 20 years. Etiology is mostly occupational asbestos exposure 
more than 90% of the cases are due to occupational asbestos exposure, but there are other causes like para-occupational exposure, non-occupational environmental exposure, and some cases are idiopathic, spontaneously arising, and radiation genetics and simian virus 40 is also, are also accused in the etiology. Low-level environmental exposure to aerionite of fibrous zeolite in volcanic tops uh, is morphologically similar to amphibole asbestos. Uh, it's a big problem in Turkey because the central part of Turkey called Cappadocia and the southeastern part of Turkey has this problem. Uh, it's in the soil, uh, aerionite is in the soil naturally and villagers are using this soil to paint the walls of their houses and from childhood till adulthood they're inhaling it and at the age of 50-60 they're having mesothelioma or asbestos related diseases. Uh, malignant mesothelioma risk from aerionite is more than 100 times when you compare it with crocidolite and approximately 50% of deaths in Korean village and there are two more villages, Tusköy and Sarıhıdır in the Cappadocia region. Uh, the deaths, more than 50% of the deaths are due to malignant mesothelioma. This is a very serious uh, number. Pleural mesothelioma is the most common form of malignant mesothelioma. Typical symptoms are chest pain and dyspnea. Soul dyspnea is about 30% of the cases. Management, multimodality treatment with chemotherapy, surgery and radiotherapy is encouraged. Uh, under the supervision of, uh, uh, of a multidisciplinary team. However, select minority is eligible for resection and survival is not significantly increasing with specific treatment. Uh, it's like 13 months to 23 months in average. There are some studies showing 35 months of survival, but these are not you know, repeatedly shown. In surgical treatment, extrapleural pneumonectomy gives a survival of 14 months. Decortication and pleurectomy is similar in giving survival. Chemotherapy is also not very good in giving survival. It's like 7 months to 12 months. And usually it's used in neoadjuvant setting. Radiotherapy, the survival is not known very well because there are not studies done on solely radiotherapy in mesothelioma but it's like similar to chemotherapy, maybe it's worse than that, and it's usually used in adjuvant setting. Symptoma uh, palliative treatment of mesothelioma includes symptomatic medical treatment, thoracentesis, pleuridesis, tunneled pleural catheters, and shunting. More than 60% of malignant mesothelioma cases can only have uh, palliative treatment because they are not fit for surgery or cannot tolerate chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Uh, their stage may be advanced. Morbidity and mortality of surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy are not very little. And best supportive care, active symptom control is important in the management of this disease. And this includes quality of life and it includes physical functioning, symptoms, mainly pain and dyspnea, and global health status. There is an ongoing study comparing pleurodesis versus definitive treatment. It is comparing video-assisted surgery, it's getting debulking the tumor, uh, versus thoracoscopic talc pleurodesis in treating patients with malignant mesothelioma. It is done in United Kingdom and it's sponsored by Papsworth Hospital, but the results are not uh, uh, here yet because it's ongoing and it's a phase three study. Palliation of dyspnea in malignant mesothelioma, like in other malignant pleural effusions, is indicated only in refractive, refractory pleural effusions causing dyspnea or respiratory dysfunction. And these symptoms should be due to the pleural effusion, not any factor else. Thoracentesis is the first step in management of refractory pleural effusions uh, in malignant mesothelioma because it shows the expandability of the underlying lung and the likelihood of symptomatic benefit from pleurodesis. The second step might be the pleurodesis in the treatment of refractory pleural effusions if 
It recurs frequently, causes dyspnea despite serial thoracentesis. For example, if the thoracentesis is required more than once a month, pleuridesis can be considered. And the indications of pleuridesis are improvement in dyspnea or the expansion of lung after thoracentesis, no alternative causes of dyspnea, life expect expectancy of more than three months, absence of multilaculation, air leak, trapped lung, bronchial obstruction, large tumor masses along pleura, and there should be no refractory pleural effusion due to infection. Here we see the trapped lung, which is a contraindication for thoracentesis and also pleuridesis. Uh, this mesothelioma patient has a ring of uh, tumor bulk trapping, uh, encasing the lung, so the lung cannot expand well. Here we see the magnetic resonance imaging uh, section showing it better. And here the patient had thoracentesis, but he has uh, trapped lung because after the thoracentesis he has pneumothorax, not because the air is entering from the atmosphere or from the lung, its lung is not ruptured, it's because of the trapped lung and the thoracentesis done uh, in this status. Predictors of failure in pleuridesis of pleural pH less than 7.30, pleural glucose less than 60 milligrams per deciliter, these show poor survival, uh, and they also show high pleural tumor load. But there is a meta-analysis done by John Hafner and colleagues. It shows that pleural pH is a poor predictor of survival. Performance status is also a predictor of uh, failure in pleuridesis. If Karnowski performance score is less than 80, it can predict the failure in pleuridesis. Survival, quality, survival and quality of life when you uh, compare it with pleuridesis. Successful talk pleuridesis increases uh, survival, and there is a study done. If there is successful pleuridesis, survival increases to 12 months versus 6 months, and this is independent of the chemothera uh, chemotherapy done. Here, talc is uh, making the mesothelial cells secret and the statin, and this causes angiostatin, and it causes apoptosis of the malignant cells. And successful top pleuridesis increases quality of life also. This is shown by the studies. Pleuridesis methods, it can be done in two ways, tube thoracostomy and thoracoscopy. Tube thoracostomy is done uh, with a sm small bore tube, 9 to 14 French. Thoracoscopy can be done medi with medical thoracoscopy or VATS. Patients' preferences, clinical suitability, expertise, and availability determine which method to use. The pleuridesis agents most commonly used is talc because it's cheaper, it's, it's efficiency is good, the results are good. It can be used as talc slurry through the tube thoracostomy, or it can be used as talc pudrage during thoracoscopy. And the su success rate is more than 90%. When you compare slurry with pudrage, slurry is a little bit less uh, effective, but it's close to pudrage. There is not significant difference in between. Tetracycline and derivatives, mostly doxycycline, can be used, but nowadays we cannot uh, find tetracycline as injectable form. Their uh, efficiency is 75%. The other agents are silver nitrate, quinoquine, iodopovidone, bleomycin, mitazantron, cisplatin, nitrogen mustard, fibrin glue, cornobacterium parvum, but nowadays it's not available. Staphylococcus iris super antigen, OK432, OK interferon alpha 2 beta, transforming growth factor beta 2. But these are re for research purposes, the last three. In the assessment of success of pleuridesis, we should know what successful pleuridesis is. It is the absence of fluid reaccumulation and symptom relief after pleuridesis. An unsuccessful pleuridesis is recurrent symptomatic effusion and the drainage requirement after pleuridesis. Timing of assessment for pleuridesis is various in different 
uh, studies, it can be one month, three months, or six months after the pleurodesis. Earlier intervention uh, is preferred owing the tendency of trapped lung, fast accumulation of fluid, and loculation in malignant <coughs> pleural mesothelioma. Uh, the complications are pain, fever, systemic inflammatory response, ampiema, dissemination of sclerism, respiratory failure. This is rare. Uh, to avoid it, small particle talc, French talc, should be used. And risk of respiratory failure is minimal if total dose of talc is less than 5 grams. 4 to 5 grams is okay. Size calibrated talc should be used, and this should be less than 10% of particles, less than 5 to 10 micrograms. Pleurodesis and abrasion should not be combined. Bilateral pleurodesis at one sit uh, sitting should not be done. Medical talc contains no asbestos. Mesothelioma has not been reported in the cases where talc has been used. If pleurodesis is not indicated or it is not successful, the other management options are repeat pleurodesis, indwelling pleural catheters, or shunting. Most commonly nowadays, in the last five years, indwelling pleural catheters are being used more than these two. In dwelling pleural catheters, the indications are poor clinical condition, trapped lung. This can be uh, found radiologically or at video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. Unsuccessful pleurodesis. It can be used initially in untrapped lung, but this is not in routine yet uh, nowadays. There are some studies done, but it's not in routine. This is the tunneled pleural catheter, indwelling pleural catheter. There is a bottle, vacuum bottle. Uh, there is a drainage line attached to it, and the distal free end can be connected to the free end of the tunnel catheter. Uh, the proximal end is inside the pleura. So whenever at home this can be used, uh, it's taught to the patient or the relatives. Whenever there is the fluid accumulating, this free end is connected to this end, and uh, the fluid is drained into the bottle. Uh, Indwelling pleural catheters are cost-effective in outpatient setting. Symptom control is like 94%. Spontaneous pleurodesis can occur uh, in 39% of the cases in one to three months in mesothelioma. Chemical pleurodesis can be done through the catheter. Complications are ampiema, tumor seeding, cellulitis, uh, and the occlusion of the catheter. Shunting nowadays is not performed very frequently. Usually, pleuroperitoneal shunting is used, and the palliation rate is 75 to 90%. However, it is not preferred owing to occlusion requiring replacement, infection, and tumor seeding. Uh, it's, it can be placed in select cases of malignant pleural mesothelioma, such as trapped lung, failed pleurodesis. In conclusion, I can summarize that pleurodesis and other palliative treatments in malignant mesothelioma requires careful selection of patients for palliation, selection of modality utilized, and it should be the least invasive, morbid, and costly treatment. Success of the initial procedure is critical because this decision will give the patient the right palliation. Shorter hospitalization is important, and outpatient treatment also is cost effective. I have two more slides, but I, it went back. I'll also invite you to the first European Congress for intervention, Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonology in March 10 to 12, 2011, in Marseille, France. I am the secretary of the European, uh, Bronco, uh, European Association for Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. I am elected this year, so it's my mission to invite you to this Congress. And I also invite you to become the member of the European Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. You see the website here. You can become members. You can do this through the website. There are related links uh, 
related to bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonology. We have the official journal respiration. You can access the journal from this website. And I, as the secretary, every month I am posting an article related to interventional pulmonology as the article of the month at the website. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Professor Simra, for this elegant talk. Now, may I invite Professor Ahmed Al Halfawi, uh, Professor of Chest Diseases, uh, Cairo University. His talk will be under the title of A New Thoracoscopy and the Plural Diseases Unit. خير واهلا بيكم في المؤتمر. Uh, this session will not be as scientific as the previous two sessions. I just want to share with you the experience that we went through to uh, initiate and start a, a, a new thoracoscopy unit. Well, since 1998, we started performing medical thoracoscopy uh, in Cairo University. Uh, we started with different, we've used different uh, 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 instruments, starting with the flexible thoracoscope, which was, which is like uh, the bronchoscope, but it's not as useful as the ones we're using now. And then we moved on to the semi-rigid. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in the previous uh, talk. And now we have the single puncture, the Carl Storz uh, rigid uh, uh, instrument. That's how we started uh, 12 years ago. We performed the thoracoscopy in uh, the bronchoscopy suite. Uh, and that's how it's performed in all the, the units that I know of in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, two years, I mean in 2000, we started uh, performing in another uh, uh, bronchoscopy suite uh, in, with a different instrument in a different hospital. <coughs> Uh, and now units are all over Egypt. I know of in Banha University, in Asyut, in Tanta, in Al Azhar University, and in other chest hospitals. Uh, but the newest unit is in uh, Giza Chest Hospital. Uh, and we started uh, working on this unit in 2009, but the actual preparation started in Jan 2010. And we were able to perform the first procedure in April, by the end of April 2010. Uh, I have to say that we've had unrestricted support from the management of the hospital uh, and generous donations from the, from the generous individuals and some uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, I need to stress on this point that we can have the, 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 the financial support of individuals to start when they feel that there is something going on and, and it's serious you can find the, the finance. The management has given us the, the, this area, which is about 80, 90 um, square meters. Uh, I would like to show you. So this is our office, the doctor's office, where we see the patient, meet the patient, consult the uh, x-rays. And we have here our uh, washing room where we change and uh, 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 disinfect. And patients would come from the wards to the to a, a special room with the changed uh, changed dress and get pre-medicated, and then they move uh, to the to the uh, thoracoscopy suite now, not the bronchoscopy suite. And we have here um, a recovery area for the after the procedure. We also have a, a space for storing the the equipment, so we don't have too much stuff in the in the thoracoscopy suite. Uh, we've had some challenges. Uh, getting the theater ready was, uh, in, my, in my opinion, was the hardest part, but uh, I found that it was not. It was one of the easiest tasks. Uh, with the help of two interested physicians who devoted themselves to the procedure, they followed the patients, they collected the x-rays, the, ordered the labs, and got well trained, now they're performing procedures on their own. Uh, we have two operating theater nurses who have helped us a lot. One of them is here. 
And uh, we have a, a devoted secretary to follow up on the patients, keep the files, and, and we also have to help to, to clean up the room and maintain the room who are not less uh, important than the uh, previous ones. We've had to work on the, on the equipment, so we got the thoracoscope, the Bhutan set, as a, as a donation from a, uh, an individual. I don't want to mention names. We started using oxygen cylinders, but the management then extended pipes, and, and oxygen piping now is available. Uh, and uh, and uh, lastly, we, we got uh, uh, ourselves a computer, so all our procedures are documented uh, in video. And then we had to develop a protocol for management of the effusions as, as, as would the, um, the, the um, uh, so we had to meet with all the physicians. There are about 20 specialists of all ages uh, who treated uh, or managed cases of pleural effusion differently, I have to say. Um, we had to ask, so we met with them and we set a, a certain protocol to follow so that we can all standardize our management. And then we had to sit for, with the lab. There is a chemistry lab, not a cytology lab. So we had to ask for some uh, new procedures, like performing differential counts on the plural effusions. They only used to differentiate whether it's an exudate or transudate, and that's it. Now we do differential counts. We're talking with, the, with them to make available the adenosine DMNAs. And we would like to have a cytologist uh, uh, in the lab, but uh, it's not available. He's not available yet. The hospital also has no CT scan, which is essential before performing the the thoracoscopies. So uh, we also had to find ways to send the patients who are uh, treated freely. They don't pay. We have to uh, make available CT scans for them. Uh, sometimes we would. Uh, uh, use the ultrasound, we talked to the people in the radiology, and so they started performing uh, and helping us with the ultrasounds on the plural space before the procedures. But the most, the hardest part of initiating the, the unit was convincing uh, physicians with the technique. Uh, the hospital is a very active center for performing closed plural biopsies. And I will show you how, how hard and how difficult it was uh, convincing those physicians uh, in a few slides. So the, 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 the standard treatment was, uh, if it's an exudate, go on for a plural biopsy. And uh, it was repeated up to two, three times. And then we'd go for open surgery before we started the thoracoscopy. And to show you the, the, the magnitude of the problem, in the last six months, there has been, although there was a thoracoscopy unit running, there has been 99 cases of closed pleural biopsies, which is not anywhere I know of now. Uh, out of those nine, 99, 36 came out to be uh, due to tuberculous effusions. 29 were mesotheliomas or metastasis from um, other malignancies or metastasis versus mesothelioma due to inadequate uh, samples. And 34 of the procedures were non-conclusive. Out of the 34, we only had 15 to perform thoracoscopy. The rest, I have no idea. Uh, and if you look at the numbers uh, through the last six months, so in April, they performed 28 uh, closed plural biopsies. The numbers have dropped. In June, there was only three performed, but the average would be like 12 or 215, although there is a thoracoscopy unit. So changing physicians' minds is a big um, issue. And now this is our, um, our new unit, one of the doctors performing the procedure. Um, uh, aseptic conditions as much as possible. It's not an operating theater, but we like to keep it this way. Uh, uh, 
the second uh, doctor now performing, they're, they're now very competent physicians performing procedures on their own. Uh, one of them fighting against the tumor. And our, our, uh, uh, our survey, we, we performed 42 cases. 90, 29 uh, of them were malignant pleural effusions, uh, or, um, 17 due to mesothelioma, 11 to metastatic malignancies, and one of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We had seven uh, cases due to, uh, due to tuberculous uh, uh, infection and six uh, other diagnoses. Four of them were paranormonic and um, two were idiopathic. We didn't reach the diagnosis. Uh, 15 out of these 42 cases had performed several plural biopsies uh, before we saw them. We also performed true cut needle biopsies um, for the, the tumors that are massive and where there is no plural effusions, uh, effusion uh, that would uh, make the procedure easy. So uh, we localized with the ultrasound and we performed true cut needle biopsies, which are very um, yielding to now. And now we are starting a new plural disease unit in Cairo University, but I hope this one is intended for research, not only for diagnosis and management, uh, uh, not only for diagnostic and therapeutic uh, aspects of the procedure. So I would like to say uh, in the end that um, thoracoscopy units are spreading. I can see through the 12 years now, they are spreading very fast. Uh, the equipment and the, the, the place uh, preparation can be made very easily. Donations, believe me, are abundant, but you have to look for, um, for, um, for those people. Uh, interest personnel are numerous, but we have to, uh, 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 we have to stress on efficient, efficient training. We have a, a Thoracoscopy course now tomorrow and after tomorrow by Professor Astul, one of the best in the world. Uh, and I hope we will make it regularly every year. But the most, of, most of important is getting to change people's mind and to drop the old procedures and to acquire the new, uh, uh, which are not new now, but the newer techniques for diagnosing uh, plural uh, effusions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for Professor Ahmed Al-Harafawi. First of all, because he was the one who promoted us to uh, institute a uh, thoracoscopy unit in Banha and who uh, trained me and some of uh, my colleagues. And we now we started to do uh, some researches about comparative study uh, uh, between uh, uh, thoracoscopy biopsies and uh, PRAMs and CDGAD biopsy. And they always uh, promote us to do more and more. Uh, now we will uh, end the session to start uh, the next one and we may call uh, the uh, chairpersons of this session. Uh, Professor Ismail uh, Abdelmenan, Professor Ramadan Nefa, Professor Manal Hosni and uh, Professor Ahmed Al-Hadidi.